Public Meeting Act, Chapter 231, Public Laws, 1975, be advised that notice of this meeting was made by posting on the bulletin board at Town Hall and serving the officially designated newspapers a notice stating that this meeting would take place at Town Hall at 7.30 p.m. tonight, Tuesday, May 15th. Please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here. Ms. Here. Ms. Here. And Mayor Here. And I have a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. We have uh, Ms. Lieberger, you're going to present a proclamation. Whereas there were 626 motor vehicle fatalities in New Jersey in 2017, and whereas a large percentage of the motor vehicle occupants killed in traffic crashes were not wearing a seatbelt, and whereas the use of a seatbelt remains the most effective way to avoid death or serious injury in a motor vehicle crash, and whereas the National Highway Sa Traffic Safety Administration estimates that 135,000 lives were saved by safety belt usage nationally between 1975 and 2000, and whereas the state of New Jersey will participate in the nationwide click it or ticket seat belt mobilization from May 21st through June 3rd, 2018, in an effort to raise awareness and increase seat belt usage through a combination of high visibility, enforcement, and public education. And whereas the Division of Highway S Traffic Safety has set a goal of increasing the seatbelt usage rate in the state from the current level of 94% to 95.5%, and whereas a further increase in seatbelt usage in New Jersey will save lives on our roadways. Now, there, now therefore, be it resolved that the Township of Melbourne declares its support for the click it or ticket seatbelt mobilization both locally and nationally from May 21st through June 3rd and pledges to increase awareness of the mobilization and the benefit of seatbelt use. Thank you. I have a proclamation um, for National Gun Violence Awareness Day. This proclamation recognizes the first Friday in June to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day in the Township of Milburn to honor and remember all victims and survivors of gun violence and to declare that we, are, that we as a country must do more to reduce gun violence. Whereas every day too many Americans are killed by gun violence and whereas over the past 10 years there have been more than 10,000 gun homicides each year and over the past couple of years that number has been climbing. And whereas education and responsible gun ownership must go hand in hand with Second Amendment rights and whereas mayors and law enforcement officers know their communities best and are in the best position to understand how to keep their citizens safe, and whereas to help honor all those whose lives have been cut short and the countless survivors who have been injured by shootings, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 1, 2018, the first Friday in June, as the fourth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June 1st, the first Friday in June in 2018, to help aware raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our community safe. Now therefore be it resolved that Mayor Charlotte H. Burson of the Township of Milburn declares June 1, 2018 to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day, and encourage all citizens to support our local community efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Do we have <clears throat> would you like to say a couple of words? I would, thank, thank you. you. Mayor Bernstein, uh, Township Committee. Uh, on behalf of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense and Every Town for Gun Safety, thank you for issuing this proclamation marking Gun Violence Awareness Day. Gun Violence Awareness Day was started by the friends of Hadia Pendleton. Orange is the color that the Diaz friends wore in honor of her life and legacy when she was shot and killed in Chicago at the age of 15, just one week after performing at President Obama's second inaugural parade in 2013. 
After her death, they asked us to stand up, speak out, and wear orange to raise awareness about gun violence. We wear orange for Hadia and to honor the more than 90 lives cut short and the hundreds more injured by gun violence every day and to demand action. Orange is what hunters wear in the woods to protect themselves and others from harm. Orange is a bright, cold color that demands to be seen. Orange expresses our collective hope as a nation, a hope for a future free from gun violence. Since 2015, Moms Demand Action has partnered with hundreds of mayors, governments, nonprofits, businesses, and individuals to make Gun Violence Awareness Day into a national event. Thank you again for being such a strong partner in our fight against gun violence. And thank you, Mayor Bernstein, for being the first Milburn mayor to be part of the Enjoying Mayors Against Illegal Guns. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the February 20th, 2018 Township Committee Minutes? So moved. May I have a second? <coughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? May I have a motion to approve the February 20th, 2018 Special Township Committee Minutes? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? May I have a motion to approve the March 6th, 2018 Township Committee Minutes? So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? I wasn't there, so I'm standing. standing. Thank you. Um, is there another question? George? Um, Good evening, Mayor and uh, Township Committee members. Um, we have a number of events taking place at the county. Uh, this Saturday is the Computer and Electronics Recycling Day up in Cedar Grove, which takes place between 9 and 3. Any of your old computers and your equipment can be brought and dropped off for recycling. Also on May 19th, um, in nearby Montclair, the Presby Memorial Iris Gardens is having their family garden party. Um, that will be over 100,000 irises in bloom. There will be um, children's activities and, and music. So it's a, it's a fun uh, event, especially for the children. Um, looking forward into June, the Essex County Fishing Derby um, continues to take place, and it will take place right here uh, in nearby South Mountain Reservation. Um, so there's information about that as well on the county website. And that's about it. <coughs> if you have any questions or concerns, I'll, I'll take them back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, reports. Mr. Levy? Yes, Mayor, I have two reports. I attended on Thursday, May 10, the Hartford Arboretum Board of Trustees meeting. It was a short meeting, but it was revealed that summer camp enrollment at the Arboretum is robust with 92 persons having signed up and more are encouraged. <clears throat> the storms took a fair toll on the trees in the Arboretum. Cleanup still continues. Most of it's been done by volunteers, but they're waiting for Doty and others for trees that the volunteers did not have sufficient equipment to move. More what the Arboretum refers to as micro event fundraising events will occur and those are smaller gatherings at restaurants at the Arboretum rather than focusing on larger gatherings which the Arboretum has found um, haven't received the type of attendance to warrant those larger gatherings. That concludes my report on the Arboretum meeting. I have a second report if there are no questions. The Board of Rec Commissioners meeting took place on May 9. And it was a long and involved meeting, but here are the sports and activity highlights. 100 kids participated in the Taylor Pond Annual Fishing Derby. A 17-inch trout was the winner, and there still is a golden trout left in the pond, which you got a special prize if caught, and it was not caught. It's been encouraged anyone wants to go fishing to get the golden uh, the golden trout. And I don't exactly know what that is. You get a prize. On June 10, there's a four-mile race uh, in town. On June 8, uh, the June 8 Yankees Mets game is sold out, so it's been asked that no one else try to obtain tickets. There's a golf tournament on July 9. In August, there is a multi-sports camp during the first two weeks. First week of June, adult softball starts uh, in two weeks. A junior science league is now taking place every Thursday at the Bauer Center. There is a first ever in Milburn spike ball tourney. The Sunday before Memorial Day, I encourage all high school and adults to participate. And a special announcement that 
uh, Milburn Rec Football, which has suffered a 92% attendance drop over the last five years, will be merging with Springfield. There is a May 21 town hall meeting for all football parents at the Springfield Rec Center for all details of the merged programs, including participation, and where games will be, and who will coach them, all will be revealed. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, just adding to the rec, on May 5th I attended a dedication at Giro Park for um, the Stephen Park Memorial Batting Cage and that's a nice project that a lot of, uh, dedicated to a former resident who died and his family and friends generated a lot of uh, donations and this was donated to the town. So it was really nice and really good beautiful project if you want to take a look at it. Uh, DMDA, we had a meeting on May 8th. We had our first quarter, our second quarter open meeting. Um, we've had a lot of changeover within the uh, leadership. Every former executive committee member has resigned and now has been replaced. Um, they're working on farmer's market. There's a meeting today on that. And the farmer's market begins on June 5th from 3 to 7. New time, same place, Tuesdays. Great for people getting off the train. Two to seven, thank two you. Seven. Two to seven, be early. Um, there's great surprises if you attend. So <laughs> we'll not be, be, be disappointed. And it's a good way to get more people to come to town after hours and stay, and stay and have dinner. So we're excited for that. Um, the DMDA also met yesterday and had a bylaws meeting. They're working on revising some of their bylaws. Um, there was an audit from the past two years that has reflected certain things that need to be done and hopefully they're slowly and surely working on those. That's it for me. Thank you. Anything? No reports. Is there a um, Just one thing I want to announce, I've asked for the South Mountain Civic Association along with the Milburn Indian American Associ Civic Association will be hosting its first ever combined event at Taylor Park this Sunday from 1 to 4. There'll be a cricket demonstration. There'll be local vendors. So it should be a really fun event for families. Please come, everybody. And if God forbid it rains, we have a rain date of June 10th. And there'll be more online that will be posted. Yes. Um, one of our town residents, Missy Rodriguez, is, con is they're having their annual uh, 5K race on Sunday, June 3rd in New Providence. It's a 7.30 a.m. start. 30 years ago, she's founded this uh, nonprofit organization that provides scholarship for organ donors and transplant recipients in every New Jersey high school. Um, it was founded by, uh, as I mentioned, Missy Rodriguez, who 30 years ago herself received a, a liver transplant. So mark your calendar, Sunday, June 3rd, 5K, New Providence. Thank you. Um, I've got a few announcements. Um, we have Fleet Week at Milburn High School, Friday, May 25th. It's open to the community, and that will be after the award ceremony. I'm not sure, uh, from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock. Uh, we will be having the interim Way dedication on Sunday, this coming Sunday at 11 a.m., the corner of, I guess, Canoebrook, or soon to be formerly known as Canoebrook, and, or I guess already no longer Canoebrook, um, and the service road by the Short Hills Mall. We want to announce that the Green Team received a $10,000 grant uh, from PSENG. It's shared with the uh, South Orange and Maplewood, and it is for their project for re reusable bags. So they are going to choose a, um, a restaurant in town, each, I guess each community picks one restaurant, to do reusable containers, takeout, bags, whatever it is, and, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So congratulations to our green team. The paper mill is going to be starting its next um, show halftime. Hopefully you get your tickets before you yell at me that it's sold out. <laughs> and um, our Short Hills Art Advisory Committee has announced some, some scholarship winners. 
and has there, uh, as always, at the library to um, see some of uh, the beautiful artwork from our community. And I think those are all my various and sundry announcements. Mr. McDonald, anything? Uh, just to two uh, brief things are the township just finished up some targeted enforcement in the um, Hobart Forest Taylor um, uh, area um, around the train station as well. We had uh, approximately 90 uh, stops, 58 resulted in summons, 26 warnings. Um, so um, continue to, you know, uh, identify some areas uh, that, that, that may need some, some special attention and uh, as we are able doing that, that type of action. A reminder to everybody in the audience as, as well as the committee that we are, tonight is our first night of live streaming. Um, so, uh, you know, this is uh, a, another uh, avenue or medium for, for people to, uh, quote, attend the meetings. Um, and is available on the Conscious website uh, under our YouTube button or the Milburn Media uh, quick link on the left-hand side of the website. That's it. Okay, Mr. Falcon. Uh, just a brief, uh, brief update. Um, as everybody's aware, the township uh, is a defendant in a lawsuit, a builder's remedy lawsuit, which I informed uh, everyone about uh, a couple of meetings ago. Uh, the planning board approved the housing element fair share plan. The township committee endorsed it and the township filed a declaratory judgment action seeking approval of the housing element fair share plan. Uh, this last Friday, uh, the township brought a motion in connection with the builder's remedy lawsuit to obtain immunity from the filing of additional suits, which the court granted. So um, that will remain in effect at least for 90 days, but during the period that the court will be considering whether or not to approve the township's housing elements and fair share plan. The judge also announced that he is going to be appointing a special master to govern all of this. Uh, uh, the identity of that person is unknown at the present time, although he's going over a list of people who are available to serve in that capacity, and we expect to hear within the next week or so. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is a presentation um, by Hashmat McDonald on the flood mitigation project. Good evening, Mayor, committee members. Um, hopefully, I can make um, flood mitigation less complicated than fair housing. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> My name is John Rushke. I've been um, with Mont McDonald, uh, formerly Killam Associates, for about 30 years. Um, I've been involved in a number of flood mitigation projects, dam safety projects, and, and local uh, stormwater improvement projects. Um, I also have Jeff Ranser with me. Um, he's a more of a mechanical engineer. Uh, I'll be touching on one of our projects, uh, the Gilbert uh, Place Pump Station, and he's, he's been a, a lead uh, project engineer on, on designing that pump station. So if there's questions regarding the pump station, Jeff is here to, to answer any questions. So the topics that I want to just touch on um, is I want to touch on Hurricane Irene, just to remind everyone regarding the, 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 the magnitude of that storm and, and how it impacted. Uh, Milburn, um, touch on the, just to remind of the flood maps, just identify where the flood zones are, the existing conditions, and then the, the pending improvements. I'm just going to run through, uh, identify some of the improvements that have recently been completed, and then those that are on, on the uh, drawing table and uh, that are ready to be, be advanced. Hurricane Irene, it happened in 2011. It was a major storm event that happened over, over two days. It was um, Basically, um, in Milburn, 8.92 inches, which is greater than a 100-year storm event. And basically, a 100-year storm event statistically is a storm that's going to happen once in 100 years, and, and Irene exceeded that statistic. Um, prior rainfall, which is, this was uh, with Irene, it was a devastating storm. And one of the reasons why it was a devastating storm is that because there was a lot of precipitation prior to when Irene actually uh, hit us. It, it, there was um, 
essentially a, a, a build up the ground was basically saturated. And that was a, a major con contributing factor with Irene because the ground was saturated, there was no infiltration, it was almost like everything was acting as impervious surface and, and it was uh, a mate and the thing major storm event. Um, the straight peaks, um, the east branch and the west branch, um, they both peaked at approximately eight, um, eight hours and 45 minutes into the storm. Um, can't emphasize enough the, how important that, that is to, to, to um, consider when, when you're looking at how, um, I'm, how the storm impacted uh, Milburn. Because it's a very important statistic when we, when we look at the flood mitigation going forward. I'm not going to go bore you on, on, storm, on calculating stormwater, but what, one factor, which I'm going to mention a number of times, is, con is time of concentration. Time of concentration is a variable that's used as a key variable when calculating uh, stormwater flow. And it basically, time of concentration is how long a rainfall drop takes to go from the, the furthest point in the watershed down to the point of analysis. And it's just a, a key um, variable that, that I'm going to mention a, a number of times. Um, this is the USGS, and it identifies the drainage areas. Um, on the uh, right side is, is the East Branch, approximately eight square miles, and on the left side is the uh, I'm sorry, the East Branch, and then the West Branch. And uh, it's my, not but not my objective to, to go through the the Army Corps model and go through what um, what uh, their plans are for uh, from a regional flood mitigation standard, but I do want to touch on one thing regarding the Army Corps. Right now they're studying the entire uh, Railway River watershed and they've come up with an alternative that they're pursuing. And one of the um, one of the treatments that they're proposing is to utilize the Orange Ro Reservoir as a detention basin. And that is so critical for Milburn because basically they, they, what they're going to do is, as part of that plan, if they, prior to a storm event, they plan on draining the reservoir and then creating a very regional detention basin. And basically what that will do will change the time of concentration. Now instead of the, the, the water going straight through the reservoir, basically that detention basin is going to change the time of concentration. And basically um, if, you, if, if the Army Corps was uh, implemented prior to Irene, that would have a very significant uh, impact on Milburn because the, the peaks of the west and, and uh, east rip branches would not have peaked at the same time, it would have been off. And so therefore, the, the magnitude of Milburn would have been significantly uh, less because of that offing of, of, of the peak and that changing in the time of concentration. So it's just something that, um, just mentioning now, is that that's with the Army Corps, it's a major project that's being considered and, and it, had, it will have great benefit for, for Milburn, uh, you know, hopefully when it goes through. Um, just from our perspective of, of flows, um, for Floyd, it was just below 8,000 uh, CFS, and for Irene, it was 8,600, which was just a, a very large storm event. Um, flow plane mapping. Um, basically, just uh, going to go into great detail, but what these maps are then really showing is, is the, the red is basically your 100-year um, flood plane, um, and the, there is um, difficult to see, but the floodway is basically where the conveyance of the river is, is, is illustrated on the heavy red lines. And then the, um, the white hatched areas is basically, that's a 500-year storm, but it's also um, a characteristic of um, areas that do flood during a 100-year storm, but in isolated areas. And that's, that's critical when you look at the FEMA map and that definition, because there are areas in Milburn that do fit that category, that actually within that hatched area do flood within a 100 year storm, but it's, it's, it's isolated areas um, uh, within the river. And just showing the downtown area, generally the area uh, that's, that's impacted. And, and again, um, this is a key slide because this is our, our, our focus has been on the East Branch, and we hard do with Oral Circle and, and Huron Court. You know that, that's the focus area of, of some of our discussion today. That's generally the, the target area or, or, or project area that we've been focused on with our flood mitigation efforts. Um, this is a um, a map that was developed in, in um, 1995 by actually by Kellum Associates. Um, and it identifies the, um, the floodplain and the floodway um, prior to the dike. 
um, which is um, important. And actually, this is uh, when we when we ever we do flood mitigation, when we're looking at permitting, we actually have to turn to this map. We have to look at FEMA and look at um, you know, both, and which is the most uh, stringent, and that's what we have to go on. But I don't point is not going to work. Oh yeah, no, it's not. Um, but basically, uh, I wanted to illustrate in, in this map, which is which is critical, is that this is the area. There's an area here that that where water would come in, and then a dike was built here. And then this is an area that we're focused on right now in future projects, is that there is still an open area, that, that this area is elevated, and then the other side is elevated too. And there is an area on her, her in circle that water does flow through from, from the river, which is a low point. <clears throat> so reported fault problems um, over the years, there's been uh, overflow from sanitary and storm sewers, basically these the systems um, they do surcharge during major storm events, which significantly reduces their, their uh, capacity. Uh, flood, flooding before the river overtops the walls. Um, we'll go through this, but basically, um, there are areas based where the river will backflow into the storm drain systems and flood the local areas. And so even before it, it overtops the walls, it's actually backflowing through the pipes and then causing flooding in certain areas. And then we do have certain pockets of areas that just flood, they're low-lying areas, and, and that they, they, do, um, they do isolate flood. Existing flood mitigation facilities um, over the years, the township has been very aggressive in doing a lot of flood mitigation. Um, you've constructed flood walls, you've constructed an earthen dike, um, you have two pump stations, you have upgraded uh, local storm sewer systems. Um, the base of design for these systems have been less than the 100-year flood event. And the reason for that is regulatory purposes. The, the DEP will not allow us to uh, design greater than the 100-year storm. I'll go into later uh, you know, some of the uh, criteria that we have to meet. But you know, basically, any flood mitigation that we do, we cannot impact people downstream. So we have to meet the DEP regulations with that. <laughs> An existing pump station at Heron Circle. It's it's uh, it's located on the dike. It's a very small pump station. It's a 5 cf pump station, and uh, Justly does more for dewatering versus any major uh, stormwater controls. Just recently, a, a um, backup generator was installed um, at this pump station. Um, the Gilbert um, Place pump station has a much larger uh, pump located. It's, it's a single pump. It's uh, it's a 30 cfs pump. Um, that's there now. Uh, and the flood walls. You have two locations that have flood walls. This is the Ringwood Road. Um, this is located at the resident side. And this is a location looking at, at the riverside. As I mentioned, the, the anything that uh, we do for flood mitigation in town, we have to uh, meet the DEP regulations. And they have very strict tolerances regarding um, what we can affect uh, with um, downstream impacts and, and the downstream impacts for a hundred year storm is, is you can impact change the you know, water level elevation by more than half an inch. So it's very restrictive. So um, whatever we do with, with permitting perspective, we have to take that in consideration. And as we um, design flood mitigation measures, we have to um, you know, meet the DEP requirements. Um, regional flood mitigation actions, you can only do so much on a local level. And it is, it is important that um, comprehensive uh, river, uh, Broadway River Basin be uh, looked at it from a regional standpoint. Coordinating with the counties is, is always critical because the, you know, they regulate the bridges and bridges are always control points. And if they could do things at, at bridge locations to, to uh, improve uh, the hydraulics is always a plus. Um, the Army Corps study I mentioned and then the, um, the Morris Avenue Bridge is another uh, control point that that's, has been discussed and, and looked at in the past. It's not uh, on the books now as being a, a future project, but it is something to look at in the future. And then uh, future desilting and desagging is always a, from a regional standpoint. Uh, when, when towns ultimately um, implement those programs, it is beneficial to all. So from a local drainage uh, perspective, there was a comprehensive report prepared by Kilo Associates in 2003. Um, the, the local mitigation measures included um, upgrading storm sewers and some on private property, pump stations, flood walls. Even though it's an older report, 
Um, the basic principles in the report are, are still valid, um, just we have more challenges now with new DEP regulations to, to, to actually implement some of those recommendations. Um, Gilbert Place Pump Station is, is one of the projects that, that is currently um, being considered as for an expansion. Um, the existing pump station, it's, it's 30 CFS, and as I said, the uh, proposed, they're, they're proposing to add two additional 30 CF uh, pumps, so it would be a total of 90 CFS uh, for that pump station. Um, because of the larger pumps and the size of pumps, it requires a large electrical service, and a, an emergency generator is proposed. Um, we have to expand, because we're basically enlarging it by, by two-thirds, it, it's Basically, we have to expand the head walls and discharge piping, the site improvements, and, and the construction budget at this point is, is approximately $2 million. Um, outstanding tasks on the Gilbert pump station. Um, there are still is an easement to be obtained, easements to be abstain, obtained. Um, DEP permits, we still have to apply for DEP permits, but we first have to obtain the easements before we apply for those permits. Um, construction documents are, are, are uh, uh, advanced in a pretty far state, but they still have to be upgrade, updated um, to address any permit conditions and, and uh, finalize it for uh, get them for public bidding purposes. Um, and then once once we come to the permitting and final design, we have to publicly bid it. And the construction period for that project is probably about 18 months. Uh, we did run into some difficulties with the uh, Gilbert pump station. Um, there is limited space uh, for the pump station structure. There, there's uh, Site constraints with uh, Green Acres, which has restrictions on, on encroachment and, and use of Green Acres property, so that was a challenge. Um, there's, e there's other utilities in, in the proximity of, of that pump station that we had to work with, with um, easements for other pipelines. There's, there's a, a joint meeting sewer uh, main that goes through that area. Um, working with the utility company to, to for um, upgrading for new electrical services and uh, there is a high high demand for the pumps. These are very large pumps. I believe they're 60 horsepower pumps. These are larger. These are larger, more like 100 horsepower, right? They're, they're, so they're very, very large pumps. And you can see one from the one photo with the, of the size of a person. They're, they're, they're very massive pumps. So existing conditions, right now, there, there's only one pump. Um, and basically, there there is no emergency backup generator. It's just an electrical controls. Um, just a concrete slab on grade, and uh, you know, there's very little improvements associated with the existing uh, pump station. Proposed conditions, it is, we're not proposing a structure at this location. Again, similar, having a, a flat concrete slab, so it's not going to be um, a, a lot of mass to it, but you know, the largest thing with mass is going to be, we'll have an emer emergency generator, so that will give it some mass. Um, there will be an electrical transformer, which, but, but basically, um, it's not going to be a structure to house all the, uh, the equipment and things. Again, um, it, it is a very large, it's pretty massive uh, underground structure. That's where the, the bulk of, of the uh, structure is. It's all underground, and basically a slab on grade is, is what you'll, uh, you'll see for, for the most part. Um, this kind of illustrates um, the red lines is basically when the pump, various pumps would come on, pump one, pump two, pump three, and then so the other lines below that in black, that's actually the elevations of area three, area one, to kind of put things in perspective in relation to the blue line, which is, that's the, the uh, 100 year, that's the flood hazard area line. So um, what I'm illustrating here is there are concerns <coughs> regarding flood impacts to downstream properties from the operation of the pump station. and. You know, that's, that's looked at very carefully, it's modeled very carefully to make sure that you know, we are not causing uh, downstream um, impacts uh, as part of the operation of the pump station. And the pump station does generally um, operate uh, at a lower elevation, it's turning on at a lower elevation and, and operating at a lower elevation um, because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not operating at that peak time when the, when the river is peaking. And again, I come back to this time of concentration thing. So basically, when you're looking at the east branch, when you look at the time of concentration of when the east branch is going to peak, 
it's going to peak in hours. It's not going to peak in minutes, where the local drainage system is going to peak in more in, in minutes and hours. And so you're going to get the majority of flow out of a local area discharged into the, into the river before the river actually peaks. And that's what we analyze. We analyze that change in, in the hydraulics and hand change in that time at, where, where the peaks occur. And that's how we make sure that we're not increasing the flow during those peaks in the river. Again, this is, kind of, this is a hydrograph. It kind of shows the, the river, where the river is peaking at almost 3,000 CFS, and the maximum that the local is peaking is, is 90 CFS, and that occurs at a very short period. Just kind of shows for illustration for purposes of, of a smaller peak being the local drainage area. Uh, the Huron Circle flood wall, this is not as advanced as the Gilbert Place. Gilbert Place is, is at a point where the design is done. It, it's, uh, we're, we're hoping that the easements are secured soon, that we can advance the permitting and actually start construction, construction with Gilbert Place. Um, this is still in the planning stage. You know, this, this is a, generally the location where I point in the very beginning where there's a small gap where water is around a high point. And, and this is and kind of was focusing on, the, on that for a, a unique feature regarding the, the terrain. And um, there were some concerns from the residents regarding the configuration of the wall and the proximity. And that's still, you know, there were some concerns and, and suggestions of pulling the wall out closer to the river and filling in the backyards. But then that becomes a, a um, loss of storage, another issue. It's harder to make that work. And so um, right now, that's, this is still in the planning stage at this point in time. <clears throat> and again, the, the, um, because the, the wall itself is not, um, it's still in planning. It's, we see that as being a, a more of a long-term uh, project uh, versus short-term. Short short-term, we're looking at, um, looking at installing a backflow preventer at, at one of the storm sewer pipes uh, located on her and Lane. <clears throat> basically, you can see where that, that arrow is pointing. That's a storm sewer. And basically, when the river starts to, uh, elevation of the river starts to come up, you'll get backflow through that uh, storm sewer and flood that local drainage system. And so, so basically, we're looking at putting a structure that will stop the water from backing up into the road and, and just be a, a, a point of, of, um, of, of just uh, stopping the river from backing in. Now, just two houses. On, on house number 16, you can see the yellow catch basin. Um, that's basically what you'll see. It's going to be another catch basin, and there'll be a, a manhole behind that, and that'll be the extent. It's not a very large structure. It's a very uh, you know, small structure to go in. It's not a very significant cost to put this in. Um, it's just a, a, a something that can go in quickly just to kind of prevent that water from backing up. Now, this is... <clears throat> This area, it's not going to be a major flood mitigation effort because you can see this is this house number 14. And this is actually the low-lying area, so the the Mac, you will eventually river will eventually come up. It will flow over that driveway, so it's not it's not a dike. It's basically just covering during a certain magnitude of storm where the water does back up, flood the road, and then uh, it'll give some protection. Now, it, as it it stops the river from flowing in. Um, there will be some minor flooding. This is not, it's not a pump station. It's not going to be water. It, you'll still have some, some localized flooding, but it won't be as great if the river is backing up in, into the pipe. So there'll still be some local uh, pumping. So the structure itself, like I said, is relatively simple. It, it, there's a valve that basically prevents the water from backing back up into the catch basin. Um, there's a manhole to allow the access and maintenance if needed. Um, and that manhole is actually bolted tight, and so it's watertight. It, 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 and take the pressure from the water backing into the system. So it's a relatively uh, you know, minor improvement. The um, Area 2 pump station, Area 2 pump station, Area 2, there's three areas basically um, within this area of town that, that has significant local flooding. And, and basically, we, we consider this area as Area 1, Area 2, and then Area 3. Area two the, is actually at a, an elevation much lower than area one and two. And so um, when you step back and look at the large picture of, of, the, of what is the plan to, to control flooding in this area, um, Gilbert Pump Station is a key, key component because that's draining basically areas one and it can drain, has a capacity to drain uh, area three. Um, it has some capacity for two, but two is in such a low-lying area that you can't get the flow 
um, to the pump station within, without doing some really um, significant radical changes on, on how the, the existing infrastructure that's there. So it becomes a little impractical to think that we're going to get that water over to the, the Gilbert pump station. So, so one scenario that was looked at was um, installing its own pump station. It would be a much smaller pump station, but have a pump station that's going to you know, drain that specific area. Now we look. We looked at a, a number of different ways of how to uh, configure that pump station. You know, this is showing two alternatives. The the alternative in red is basically installing a gravity system and then installing the pump station um, near the river. And so that that's one scenario. Another scenario was actually installing the pump station um, uh, within the rear of the yards and then having a force main to to, to discharge into it. Um, the, the one main concern um, with this is that the, the, even what, what's proposed is even a um, 60 horsepower, that, that's where the 60 horsepower is, or these, these pumps were 60 horsepower, so even with 60 horsepower, it, it requires a very substantial electrical cabinet, and so that's what gets awkward of having this massive electrical cabinet in someone's backyard, or um, you know, where would that be located, um, and so that's the biggest feature that I think is awkward with this. Another, another situation is that under the one scenario where we're having alternative one, where we're putting the pump station in the river, a little bit more of a remote area, um, but the pipe is relatively deep and, and, and the excavation near those homes is a major concern. It, it's a deep excavation very close to homes and it's, 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 a, it's an issue. Um, we have looked at other scenarios. One scenario was looking at uh, putting a, a much smaller pump station in the in the road itself, and and, and not have to have it more for dewatering purposes versus stormwater control, just to just uh, kind of keep away, uh, try to keep the nuisance of, of the flooding away versus actually controlling in that extent. Um, but even with that, the smaller pump, it, it requires an electrical cabinet. It's just something that's not characteristic that you would see on a residential road, you know, right at the location. So this is kind of a, a, a profile of the two sections, Number uh, the red being what I described as gravity, and you can see basically there's, there's pipes in the road itself that is causing that, that pipe to be so deep and, and we have to get gravity to that uh, pump station at the riverside. So that's what the concern is, is with um, that pipe being very close in, uh, to the homes and, and uh, you know, exceeding 10 feet in depth. Um, that's why we looked at the other scenario of being a pump station um, in the rear of the yards and that then we would need a force main and the force main could be relatively shallow, it's not as much of a concern going between the homes. Um, but again, that, that pump station is going to be in someone's backyard. Um, the, that, that is the low-lying area, so you have to have electrical equipment that probably has to be above five feet, and then you have a massive cabinet above that. It, it, it becomes a little awkward you know, infrastructure to be putting in someone's backyard, which is that's the challenge that we're having right now with Area 2 pump station. So this is really just more of a, in a planning stage. It just really hasn't been advanced. Um, there was some design, um, preliminary design done on the pump station on, on the riverside, just because that seemed to be the more practical end, just to kind of get um, you know, the sizing and, and, and configuration, just to see if that, you know, just for more discussion purposes uh, for that. So that, that has been done, but nothing to the point where that's ready to bid at all. Um, this is the last slide. Basically, flood mitigation summary. Um, you know, Irene, major storm event. Um, uh, it was a new flood of record. Um, anything we do in town is not going to mitigate Irene. It's just not going to happen. It's just too, too much of a large of a storm. It's just nothing that we can do. Um, you know, flood control has limitations. It's more of risk reduction. It, it, it's you're, 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 you're um, doing infrastructure to try to minimize the risk, but the risk is always going to be there because even with Irene, there will always be a larger storm. So you have to take that in consideration um, when you're doing it. And, and, it does, the flood mitigation doesn't, I think I can't emphasize enough, it doesn't, it's not going to address Irene. The Army Corps, certainly if they do their project with local flood control, if you're starting to see some benefits, not that I can represent that we're going to be um, doing uh, something greater than a 100 year storm event, but you, you do start to get um, some true benefits of, um, you know, when you're looking at from a regional and a local standpoint. That's all I have. Does anybody on the committee have questions? No, it's very clear. It's, you know, we're, we don't know where we're going with this yet. Does um, anyone in the um, public have questions? Mr. 
I'm Terry Hiller, 56 Byron. I grew up in the South Mountain area, very familiar with the East and the West branch, um, and in the downtown. Uh, you referenced at Irene in 2011, both rivers peaked at the same time. If the building known as the Footer Building were not in the downtown, and you didn't really speak much about the flooding in the downtown, which I think is a little bit different than what happens with the two rivers meet, what would happen to the downtown? The Orange Reservoir empties at a different time. Which in the reservoir is not really a reservoir, just it's, for purposes of yeah, just clarification, yeah, it's just yeah. a body of water right now. Mm -hmm. So what would happen downtown if that building were not there? Or describe what is happening with that building there. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can't speak the, the specifics on that building. Yeah, yeah, we can. Um, I actually have Kevin Nolte that he's, he's with the with the hydraulic modeling. If you we, we make any representation, I don't want to you know, mislead. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, they would want to make the reservoir, you know, attenuate the flow. So, I don't know, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's going to reduce the peak flows. So, that would have a benefit on, on downtown. What are you saying? Removing. What's that? You're, you're saying about removing a structure. Is it Paul who's one of the principals or was principal? You talking about removing, removing the... Well, no, who, who's the principal of the company? I've discussed this at length and met in downtown. Is it Paul who's one of your... Leo Coakley? Okay. Yeah. So we met several times, yeah. spoke on the phone. What happens downtown is described more as a flashlight. It passes through, it hits yeah. perhaps the bridge, yeah. it hits yeah. the building, comes through the town, water eventually ends up in Cranford. We, we all know that story. Yeah. There's bridges and other things that yeah. get in the way. But it's my understanding in speaking with Leo, going back and seeing through three storms how the water moves through the downtown. I'm not suggesting necessarily that the building be removed. My question is, I believe, whether the two rivers are peaking at the same time or not, whenever the water decides to come through the downtown from when the reservoir overflows, called the reservoir, when it hits the downtown, whenever that is, I don't think that has anything to do with what is happening downstream where the two rivers meet down below Home Depot. So when it comes into the downtown, my understanding, I'm asking the form of a question, is I believe that building acts as a dam, a wedge, and causes the water to run down Essex Street to Main Street, runs down to the left of the river, it's, down it's through. Definitely it's definitely restriction. It's, like it's a restriction. Yeah, just like any bridge would be, you know, it's functioning like a bridge. It's, it's an obstruction. It has only such an opening. And the water has to get through there. When it can, it backs up and it goes somewhere else. You know? Yeah. Now, the, what the Army Corps is doing is is, is attenuating the flow. It's slowing the flow down. It's, it's cutting off the peak, and so. Your, your peaks at, through, through town should be less. I, again, I can't talk specifics because I don't have a model in front of me, but um, it should be less. So I, I, the model should be reflecting that the impact is going to be less from what they're doing at that point. Could it be? Could the impact be even more beneficial by removing it? Probably. If any, rest, any restriction in the river being removed, is a, you'll see a benefit. The question is, how significant is that benefit? And so you'd have to model that to see exactly what the benefit is. I would just ask you, what's something that going back to 99, it's been discussed by any number of township committees in the past. The building happens to be sitting vacant, at least for the moment. Nobody's suggesting necessarily condemnation, though, a negotiated purchase if there is a benefit to do so. I would add a further benefit that it's a loss of a rate wall. That's not a benefit. To lose that building, which wasn't there historically, the rivers, the rails, the, the old historic pictures of the paper mill, you open up the South Mountain Reservation. Thank you, but this is really a time in the question. For, Could we it's model? It's really not appropriate right now, so if you want to raise that one during public discussion, we certainly not. Could we model that into, he, he didn't represent as part of the modeling. Is that something that we could look at, benefit the downtown so the downtown doesn't flood? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're not off the hook. Bring him on. Hi, Steve, Steve Nicholas, Seven Horan Circles. Um, one thing you said, which hopefully is putting our mind to ease on Horan Circle, uh, a concern we have is if you dump all this water from Ridgewood with the pump into the stream 200 feet above where the low point at 14 Horan is, logically it's going to go out of Ridgewood and come onto a ramp. Now, how is this pump system turning itself off when the 
river is, is peaking? There, there's, it, it, there's, it's monitoring the level. So if there, if there is a, the one thing with, um, you know, we, we can look at predictions and we always model based on ideal conditions because that's, that's the industry standard. If you look at ideal conditions, you know, and then that, unfortunately ideal conditions don't always happen. And so if you, if we, there is a, a, a um, safety precaution in, into the controls based on elevations that the pumps will shut down if they're going to be causing a, an increase in elevation. So it's automatic. You it's know, automatic. Yeah, it's automatic. automatic. It's on the controls. Okay. And so they've taken that low yeah, point. We took, we, yeah, we took that, okay. take that into consideration. Okay. Couldn't, couldn't I had a fight with Killam for, for uh, many meetings with them before they finally pulled out the map and admitted, yes, it is a low point at 14 Iran. For a long time, they were oh, a little it's bit it's in a denial. Low point. They, no, they, they were in denial for a while. But, but we, you know, yeah, we finally yeah. got out the maps, and, yeah. and there was there there is. Is. It's it's show around the map. Okay. Yeah, it is, it's okay. definitely okay. a low it, point. It's, you know, we're just concerned should the the dike on the wall on Iran come before the pump, but if they'll really turn off. When yeah, the, yeah the, the, the low point on the wall is high enough where it should not be an issue at all with the pumps. It's, you're, you're looking at larger, larger storms than what you would see at the localized for the pumps. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I do have one question. So if you do this um, backflow preventer, who is in charge of doing that? Is that an automatic? Is it DPW? It's, it's automatic. It's, it no, is. it's just all of the, it, it's a valve that basically when the water, it, it prevents, as long as the river is not backing up, the water flows through it. Okay. If the river starts to back up the pipe, it'll just stop the water. And so it'll just stop the water from backing up. It's all automatic. And it's, it's usually not a heavy maintenance item either. It, it's, it's usually, and, and in fact, you can just look in, in the structure itself as you see if there's a problem, it's not the end done. It's a low maintenance. And it would be sediment. Yeah, it, it would be. Well, they, 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 they should not be sediment. Actually, in the sump itself, they, there's um, and, and the valve that even closes with sediment. It, it's it's the way, it is a maintenance. It's the type of valve it is. But again, it, it's it's a it's a benefit, but it, but the extent it's not going to substitute for the wall. It, it's it's just it's, it just prevents that localized flooding from happening from just from backing up the pipe. We've all seen that. It's my neighborhood, so I've okay. seen it. I've experienced it. Okay. Yeah. So there, there's a benefit, but again, it, 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 it's not a, a it's not that's by no means is going to stop substitute for water. Thank you. Lincoln, 93 Cedar Street. Uh, just a point of information, though. You mentioned the Army Corps plan is going right. to drain the reservoir. The orange river, that's, yeah. that's the plan? Well, no, the, pl the plan is not the, the, the plan is, which is actually is, an issue with the Army Corps, because it's a little unique, is that they would drain, they would lower the reservoir prior to the storm and do it at a controlled way of, of probably draining it within 48 hours prior to the storm hitting. And, and then have it available for capacity during the storm. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be drained all the time. It's, it's going to be, a, and, and that, and the holdup with one of the issues with the Army Corps is that that has to be manually done. And that's, that's a little unique from an Army Corps project is that it has to be manually done. It's not automatic. And so that's one of the things that they're reviewing. And they have to do some uh, modifications to set up a structure to drain it? Yeah, they, they'll, they'll have a low flow. Actually, they, they, it's an existing dam. It, they have a low flow structure already there. But they, um, it, one of the other issues that, that's being reviewed is that the um, dam itself um, uh, meets DEP, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Standards. But if it's a federal project, it has to meet RB Core standards, which is a little more strict. And the Army Corps, based on their cost analysis, they're assuming they have to rebuild the whole dam. And that's one of the contentions that uh, people have, is that why are you making that massive <coughs> assumption that the entire dam has to be removed and reconstructed? You should do a geotechnical analysis to see how you can just modify the dam. And if they do that, the cost-benefit cost ratio would be significantly better. Thanks. You're welcome. We'll make right. the uh, presentation available on the website. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, sorry to interrupt. What's the, the timeline for construction of the Grand Circle? Um, it, there is, it's not set at this point. Consent agenda consists of bills, 
authorized refund of tax payments, authorized refund of sewer, sewer overpayments, authorized Milburn Township tax collector to prepare and mail estimated tax bills in accordance with law, mm -hmm. approved sidewalk cafe licenses, authorized participation in the New Jersey State Health Benefits Program Act for local prescription drug coverage, authorized execution of storm sewer indemnification agreement, authorized execution of grant agreement with the Township of Milburn and the Essex County Municipal Alliance, County of Essex Office of Alcoholism, Drug Abuse and Addiction Services, and approval of raffle licenses. Um, <coughs> anyone on the Township Committee have any questions or comments on any of the items on the consent agenda? No? Anyone in the public have any questions or comments with respect to any of the items on the consent agenda? No? May I have a motion to approve the resolutions listed on the consent agenda? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May I roll call please? Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Paul Edward? Yes. And Ms. Person? Yes. Mr. Levy, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2500-18. Yes, Mayor. I present for consideration Ordinance 2500-18, amending Section 411 of the Township of Milburn Development Regulations and Zoning Ordinance Code entitled Guarantees and Inspections, which clarify and provide necessary amendments to conform with municipal land use law. These are largely technical amendments that we've discussed before, the purpose of which is to, among other things, assure installation and maintenance of certain on-track improvements, including furnishing of performance guarantees and maintenance guarantees, performing for guarantees for perimeter, perimeter buffers, performance guarantees not to exceed certain cost installations, and temporary certificate occupancy guarantees, among other. Tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passage advertised in accordance with law. I declare the hearing open. Any questions, comments? Mayor, I see nobody responding to your declaration of the hearing being open and moved that the hearing be closed the ordinance be adopted on final reading. The township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading and according to law. May I have a second? Second. May I have a vote, please? Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lieber? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Paul Yes. Yes. Ms. Paul Eglow, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2501-18. I present for consideration an ordinance entitled Township of Milburn Ordinance Number 2501-18. An ordinance of the Township of Milburn, County of Essex, State of New Jersey, authorizing the establishment of a government energy aggregation program. The purpose of this ordinance is to establish a government energy aggregation program in the Township of Milburn as required by NJSA 48.93 in order to benefit from price reduction advantages associated with aggregating residential and business electric service for consumers and increasing the township's use of renewable energy sources. As required by statute, Milburn must pass a government energy aggregation ordinance. This ordinance fulfills the statutory requirement and allows the Milburn Township Committee to act as the lead agency for the government and energy aggregation program in Milburn. Once passed, this ordinance allows Milburn to move forward along with neighboring municipalities forming the Sustainable Essex Alliance in implementing the proposed community choice aggregation recommended by accepted consultants, Gable Associates. Tonight is the time set for the public hearing and final passes of advertising according to the law. I declare the hearing open. Does anyone have any questions or comments on uh, this ordinance? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, I move that this public hearing be closed and the ordinance be adopted on final reading and the township clerk be directed to publish the ordinance by title as passed on final reading in accordance with law. May I have a second? Second. Can we roll call the first? Mr. Levy? Yes. Ms. Lee Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Paul Edwin? Yes. Ms. Yes. I would like to present an ordinance entitled Township of Milburn, Ordinance Number 2503-18, 
bond ordinance to authorize the making of various public improvements in, by, and for the township of Milburn in the County of Essex, State of New Jersey, to appropriate the sum of $790,000 to pay the cost thereof to make a down payment to authorize the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation and to provide for the issuance of bond anticipation notes in anticipation of the issuance of such bonds. Um, these are the improvements that are being discussed are uh, undertaking of improvements to various sanitary sewer pump stations, renovation of the restrooms of town hall, including ADA improvements, reconstruction of Mountain View Road, and the, those three items together uh, come to the $750,000 that uh, is being discussed. discussed. I move that the ordinance to be taken up and passed on first reading and that the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with law in the item and for hearing and final passage on Tuesday, June 19th, 2018. Do I have a second? Second. Can I please? Mr. Reedy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Paul Edmund? Yes. And Ms. Person? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg, you are scheduled to sponsor Ordinance 2504-18. I would like to present an ordinance entitled Township of Milburn Ordinance Number 2504-18, Capital Ordinance of the Township of Milburn in the County of Essex, New Jersey, authorizing the making of various public improvements and acquisitions in, by, and for the township, appropriating the sum of $1.45 million, and providing such sum appropriated should be raised from the Capital Improvement Fund of the township. So, what are we getting for this? Fire department gets an SUV, some communication and signal systems, some heating and cooling units, about $245,000. DPW for $520,000 gets a sewer inspection camera, new automotive vehicles, and a pickup truck with a plow. Recreation for $158,000 will have some improvements, including playground improvements at Giro and um, HVAC upgrades at Bauer. General building improvements like Town Hall for $100,000. Engineering, seal coating and micropaving of various roads, $125,000. Police department, new communication and signal system equipment, portable radios, machinery, $252,000. And engineering, drainage and sanitary, sanitary sewer improvements at various locations for $50,000. Sum of $1.45 million is hereby appropriate to the payment of these costs of improvements. I move that this ordinance be taken up and passed on first reading, and the township clerk be authorized to have the ordinance published in accordance with the law on the item, and for hearing and final passage on Tuesday, June 19, 2018. May I have a second? Second. Mr. Leedy? Yes. Ms. Lieberberg? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Paul Edmund? Yes. And Ms. Persons? Yes. Okay, the next item is Resolution 18 135. Authorizing the Township of Milburn to become a participating member of the Cooperative Purchasing System, named the Sustainable Texas es Sustainable Essex Alliance Energy Procurement Cooperative, with the Township of Maplewood as lead agency, for the purpose of purchasing electric generation services for residents of the Township of Milburn via a government energy aggregation program. Are there any comments or questions pertaining to resolution 18-135? From the committee first. Any questions, comments? Okay, we have certainly discussed this before. Any questions or comments from the public? No? Okay. Yeah, how do you get 2.1 oh, no, million no, no, no. approved? If you have a question about this resolution, yes, no? What about the other two? Nobody the other two will be up for public hearing, and you're going to ask your questions. Not a problem. For Thank you. No problem. Okay. June 19th. June 19th. Correct. Okay. Um, with respect to resolution 18135, any questions or comments? All right. Um, may I have a motion to approve resolution 18135? So moved. May I have a second? Second. May I have a vote, please? Mr. Leedy? Yes. 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 Okay. Next item on the agenda is proposed zoning changes to the B1 zone Short Hills Mall. We have a B1. B1. 
some upcoming business uh, at the mall. Uh, there are a variety of upcoming uh, big developments happening at the mall that I'd like to bring up. This map just orients us to the property. Uh, the lion's share of what we're going to talk about tonight is happening in the former Saks building. Uh, one of the key items that um, I'd like to discuss is a, a potential re-examination of our parking requirements. Um, the as written, uh, we are required to provide 4.25 spaces per thousand square feet of retail on a basis of 1.4 million square feet of retail in the mall. The current upcoming changes that we are proposing will reduce the square feet of retail from 1.4 million to 1.36 million and transfer 30,000 square feet of retail to office for a total of 1.39 million square feet. As written, the requirement would then jump us up to 4.5 parking spaces per thousand from, and I think I misspoke. As written, at 1.4 million square feet of retail, we only need 4.25 spaces for the parking spaces per thousand square feet. By reducing the square footage due to 10,000 square feet being converted to a common area vestibule for elevators and stairs, we would then need to provide more parking spaces based on the way that the code is written. So we'd like to propose a, a, a re-examination of that. Um, you, from a practical standpoint, as the general manager of the mall, I'm there every day. I can tell you with great certainty that the mall parking does, does not fill up. We have thousands of available parking spaces every day. The only day that gets close is Black Friday, and even on Black Friday, we don't fill. We have a lot of congestion in the mall, which creates a look of a backup, but if you can walk around the upper levels of the parking. There are plenty of parking spaces. So. Um, that was the first order of business. Um, beyond that, I'd like to discuss some of the changes that are coming in the Saks building. The, the lower floor of the Saks building, level one of the mall in the interior, has been signed by Indigo, which is Canada's largest bookseller. Um, what makes Indigo very unique is that they do more than 50% of their business uh, via items that are not books. So they are founded on books, um, but they've done a nice job of merchandising their stores to complement books in those sections. So in the kids' Book section, there will be toys and games and items for, for children. In the cookbook section, there will be kitchen utensils, uh, display cooking, celebrity chefs, things like that. So I've uh, included a variety of photos here. These are some of the photos from a different Indigo store up in Canada. Again, Indigo is Canada's largest bookseller, um, and they're tremendously popular. This will be their first store in the United States. So you can see the way that they really tastefully merchandise their stores. Um, doesn't give you the appearance of a bookstore, although they're certainly founded on, on books. Um, the next big development to happen in the mall is uh, what we've listed here as the Food Emporium. Um, we have recently closed down Joe's and Paparazzi mm -hmm. and um, have annexed the space next to Ralph Lauren, which is Ralph Lauren Kids, and we are going to be converting that into a 17,000 square foot Italian marketplace concept. Uh, maybe uh, many people compare what we're building to Italy. Um, we have this concept in our San Juan, Puerto Rico location, and um, it is wildly popular down there. It's it's effectively s similar to Italy without the gourmet grocery component. Um, and this will be again a little over 17,000 square feet. 13,000 square feet will be the marketplace, and about a 4,000 to 4,500 square foot sit-down restaurant in that quarter of the mall. That's currently under, uh, under construction and that will be opening in October. Um, these are some photos of some of their other locations around the United States, uh, or I should say in, around uh, Puerto Rico and in, in Europe. We will have their first United States location.
Back to the Saks, the former Saks building. The second level of uh, the Saks building is now signed by Crate and Barrel. So Crate and Barrel will relocate from the other side of the mall over to this area and take 30,000 square feet of the second floor of the Saks building, which the way the grade of the land um, comes up in this area, the uh, exterior parking lots meet up with the second level of the mall. So that in this area, the first level where Indigo is, is actually uh, subgrade. <clears throat> Here are some photos of the uh, renderings of the proposed facade. Um, it used to be the Saks building. The portico shares already been taken down. Um, the Saks lettering has been taken down. And this is what's proposed to go up in the place of that. This is an image of the uh, 10,000 square feet we'll be recapturing that I mentioned previously. Um, that will be the entry vestibule on the second level of that building where customers can go down to Indigo, they can go straight into Crate and Barrel, um, or they can go up to the third level of the Saks building, which will most likely be leased out to Office um, as it doesn't enter directly into the mall. Um, so Office makes the most sense for that. Some other looks at the facade. The renderings. Crate and Barrel has um, proposed, and in their drawings, they've drawn a patio, a 600 square foot patio, on the um, the right side of the building. Um, in your printouts that I've handed you, I've added additional photos uh, based on some some last minute questions I got. People ask me, would this patio area be similar to a Home Depot? Will there be stacks of chairs and grills and things like that, and the answer is no, and so I, I represented that in your handouts. What Crate and Barrel intends to do is tastefully set up the patio as if it were a high-end residential patio. So they would display some of their outdoor furniture in a way so that you could sit down and enjoy it and get an idea of the way that you could decorate your own patio. It won't be stacked with saleable items, they'll keep those in the back room like they always do, it'll just be set up like a showroom outside. And here's a bit of a recap. Um, so again, this square footage issue that I mentioned at first, the Saks building itself is, it contains 100,000 square feet. But we'll be taking back several thousand square feet on every level to create that vestibule. So we'll reduce the square footage of each level from 33,300 square feet to 30,000 30, square feet flat uh, gross leasable area. That's that 10,000 square foot difference. This illustrates uh, the parking uh, situation that I mentioned um, that I'm hoping we can re-examine. I won't read through it. Take everyone's time. And the last order of business uh, for me this evening is the proposal to add several locations in the center of the mall um, that we would refer to as permanent vendor displays. We had initially discussed uh, maybe doing four locations. We put five on the map, not that we're interested in necessarily moving forward with all five, but we're hoping to get approval for all five locations so that we can choose which ones will be the best fit. Um, the retail landscape in the world is changing, and people more and more need a, a reason to go out and shop. And what we intend to do with these spaces is provide a comfortable place for people to grab something light to eat, um, while they're moving their way through the mall. Um, they would be three, 300 square feet or less. Um, and, you know, again, these would be sort of light bite, grab and go, coffee, uh, pastry, um, something like that, a sandwich perhaps. Are they retail too or is it just food? Well, we don't want to limit out retail, but we're not interested in pursuing retail right now. But we, we'd like to discuss the possibility of having that language so that it could be allowed. So it's retail or food? Then. Yes, please. Yes, sir. At the mall's option. That's right. So these four locations represent the locations on the lower level of the mall, um, starting in the top right um, with uh, Bloomingdale's up there, moving down. The second one, uh, which is called location two, on, uh, I'm sorry, location three on the map is at Starbucks. Location two on this map is where the former guest services desk was, which is now an empty area. And location one is on the south side of the mall, uh, where right in front of Neiman Marcus, the flowers, the flower wall. Okay. The fifth proposed location would be upper on the upper level um, in the luxury wing, in between the new 
Salvatore Ferragamo and Burberry stores, there's a seating area there uh, that we would propose to put something in, um, something tasteful. These locations that we're talking about, um, I also want to clarify that, you know, you'll walk through malls in the U.S. and you'll find rolling carts that have the cell phone cases and uh, the lotions and potions, and that's not what we're talking about. Uh, what we're proposing is building permanent, built-out, architecturally designed, tasteful units that are permanent and built into the place. Um, so I've got some examples of what those might look like. Let's go through the locations again. But when you look at something like this, um, you're not blocking lines of sight, you're not cluttering up the mall, and you're providing egress by, but people have the option of stopping by to get something to eat. Um, same with this, a high-end display case where somebody could spend a moment, linger, have a seat, enjoy something, regroup, and then continue to shop. Here's a, a rendering of another proposed, um, a proposed permanent vendor display that we could uh, do something like this, right, maybe in the center of the mall by that Starbucks location. And that concludes my presentation. Again, you'll have a few additional pages in yours, um, township committee members, and uh, I welcome any questions. I also wanted to let you know that Paul Phillips, the township planner, is also here if you have any questions. So, uh, Frank and Farrell, is that always going to be outdoor furniture, or will it be changing? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine they would put indoor furniture outside. Um, everything I've heard from them, they only intend to put outside furniture, but I, would, I can follow up and ask them to do that. And will it be there all year round? Yes, that's my understanding. Are you still going to have seating in the mall? Yes. Yes. Plenty of seating. Plenty of seating. The permanent kiosks, I'll call them kiosks, I know that's a word that you wouldn't use. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the ones that do dispense food, would they have cooking facilities as part of them? They would not at that location, though. They would have them in back areas of the mall uh, within the appropriate distance away, from, uh, according to the health code. Okay. And the food then would be prepared in the back areas that you can measure. Correct. And, and then transfer it out right. on carts yes, sir. to the mm -hmm. um, various locations. That's right. So you would have carts going through the mall with prepared food on it back uh, and forth. On times that we decide, sure. Yeah, I, I would I would imagine that to be mostly pre-opening though, to stock up. You know, I think in the afternoon they might want to replenish, but I you know these would be things that we would control very, very tightly. You know, the, the mall at Short Hills is not the mall that we want to see carts of food mm -hmm. meandering about. Um, that's certainly not what my intent is. And being the general manager, I'll, I'll oversee that closely. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What do you anticipate the hours for the Eagley concept? Will it be open before the mall opens and stay open after the mall closes? I don't foresee it being open uh, before the mall does. It doesn't usually make business in a mall, um, make sense business-wise in a mall setting to open a restaurant early. Uh, but I would imagine that they would stay open till a regular restaurant at an hour, maybe 10 p.m. But we haven't discussed that with them yet. We're not that far. And it will be serving alcohol. Yes, as a liquor license. A full liquor license, not just beer and wine. Correct. Mm -hmm. I've been to Italy, or actually Italy in Copenhagen, something like that. It was amazing. It was such a fun experience, and I think this will add a real panache to the mall. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah me too. I think it'll bring a lot of new life to the mall, mm -hmm. uh, and another reason for people to want to go and stop by, right. come to our area in general. Yeah. You know, beautiful. from surrounding towns, I think it'll drive a lot of business. And the new facade of from this, where the sack will miss sacks, of course, yeah. but this also looks like it's planned out really well. Mm -hmm. well thank you. Yeah. Do we have questions? Or just well, I have oh, follow -up. Follow -up. You have four locations designated for the um, semi-permanent structures <laughs> yes. in the mall. Uh, I assume you want approval for five with your discretion to open five or less, five or fewer. Correct. Yes, sir. And we don't have a current plan to open all five, but there's debate about which of the lower level center locations makes more sense to get service area or in front of Starbucks based on seating. There's great seating in front of Starbucks, but the right. guest service area is you know, ready for a refresh. So they said, you know, my executives and I decided we, we should come to the table with five and, um, and see if we can get that uh, to start, and then we can figure out what we really want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I assume you have lease restrictions to deal with as well, too. Oh, yeah. That's an internal matter, too. Oh, yeah. That's right, yeah. Lease restrictions is more than you can imagine. I can imagine. Does <laughs> <laughs> anybody have questions of the uh, phones? Have you looked at this phone? Yeah, I can just comment for a few seconds That'd if you think it's appropriate. So we've had the opportunity through coordination with Alex to take a look at this and review some of the materials that were prepared not only this evening but prior this evening by uh, Taubman. Um, we would need, uh, if, if the Township Committee is predisposed, likes these ideas, and I think uh, I would just add that they would need to be properly regulated through zoning changes, but if you're predisposed to seeing these changes come to fruition, we would need to, uh, in order to facilitate them, we need to amend the zoning ordinance in the B1 Regional Business District where the uh, Mall Short, Short Hills is located. Um, we would need to provide for and uh, appropriately regulate what I would refer to as permanent vendor displays. And I've had some experience in other municipalities where there are malls uh, and I would agree that uh, we need to refer to them as permanent vendor displays, the type of uh, kiosks, things on uh, mobile units, things on wheels is something that I think both the mall operator as well as the township uh, probably feels is not a good thing in keeping with the, uh, the basic or, if you will, of the uh, mall. Uh, we would uh, regulate how many. Uh, originally we were thinking four, it could be four or five, we would have to regulate where they're to be located so we don't impede pedestrian uh, access. <clears throat> there was a question about food, uh, and um, we kind of just in, in looking at how we might draft this, uh, would indicate that no cooking or warming of food in ovens be allowed, although we were potentially considering uh, the use of the microwave uh, in some of these in this area, but no cooking, no ovens. Um, the, uh, we would limit the area, and we agree that 300 square feet is the right area based on our own uh, experience. Uh, we would also make it absolutely clear that temporary or non-permanent vendor displays not be permitted. I mean, strongly urge that that go in, uh, that, that these would have to be permanent displays. Uh, there's some building code and UCC uh, regulations that would have to be kind of uh, basically uh, put into the uh, ordinance. Uh, we probably would not include the space towards the GLA. GLA it's, it's really part of what is now the common area of the uh, mall. Uh, but again, if you are predisposed to thinking this is a good thing, we could draft regulations which I think would sort of protect the, the public interest but would allow the operator to kind of go in that direction if you so choose. On the other uh, changes, the uh, allowing the outdoor display of certain merchandise in the crate and barrels, reuse of the uh, portion of the sack space. Uh, we could also come up with regulations. It's a little trickier there because we're dealing sort of with one particular location within the mall, so we would have to kind of use all our creative juices to come up with a, a zoning standard in order to have it, you know, make sense. But um, there, the issues there would be things such as, you know, access. Uh, really, you want to have access from the interior of the store rather than just access for people coming out of the common areas and parking areas and so forth. Uh, whether there's any enclosures uh, and also limiting the type of uh, merchandise that would be uh, displayed, such as you represented that would be, for example, summer uh, type uh, outdoor furniture that would kind of fit within the outdoor covered patio context and, uh, and setting. Uh, and also that space uh, probably would not count towards the, uh, the GLA. But again, <coughs> excuse me, if you're predisposed to pursuing this, we could draft something that sort of, you know, gives them some flexibility but protects the municipality. And lastly, on the parking standard, uh, this is sort of interesting because the way the standards are written, and they were changed probably a good, I'm going to think about seven, eight years ago, uh, the actual, currently the higher the amount of retail square footage, uh, the, the lower the retail parking requirement. So as you go up in terms of the total retail s uh, square footage, the actual parking re requirement goes down, which is based on empirical evidence. 
what would happen is that if they converted the Saks building and put in 30,000 square feet of office and then had the 10,000 square feet of common area, they would reduce the amount of retail square footage down to, I think, 1360. What that would do, then, it would take them into a category where the retail parking requirement would be higher. Because right, right now they're at that threshold of 1.4 where they have the lower standard. And then when you add in the parking standard for office, which is actually lower than the retailer, uh, they would have uh, less parking than the current capacity of the mall. So I think there might be a way to amend the parking, understanding also that based on the non-coincidental peaks of office and retail, particularly on, week on weekends mm -hmm. when the office use is typically not used, there probably would be sufficient parking. So again, we could use our creative juices to come up with a, with a method to amend the, the parking requirement to take into account those changes. So those would be the three things uh, that we would need to do. And if, it, if the township committee so chooses, we, we could take a crack at drafting uh, an ordinance that, that would facilitate these changes. It is, I presume, that if this, the mall is the only one with this amount of free cash space. I'm sorry? The mall is the only, the B1 zone is the only yeah. zone with the amount of retail space we're talking about. That's correct. So even if you reduce um, the amount of parking per, per thousand, it's only going to really impact the mall. Anyway. That's correct. And the B1 zone, geographically, Mayor, only covers the, right. the mall. Right, the mall. So, yeah. Right. So, okay. Right. So you're not affecting anyone else adversely. Right. You're correct. And in terms of, I'm just curious because he referred to the um, outdoor space at, at Creighton Barrow as an outdoor showroom. So right. why wouldn't it be part of the July? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I if it, 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 we could, well, the thing, there are two choices. We could exclude it from the GLA, or if it's included within the uh, within the GLA, then um, we probably have to look at how that would affect the. Uh, parking requirement number one and then right now there's a, a maximum of the 1.4 million uh, so it may trip that uh, threshold so we, we, we would look at that I mean those are the two ways to do it but why wouldn't you just treat it as it's treated in the lease um, I'm not sure how would it be treated in the lease is it, I, I, just to answer your question yeah. I don't think it would trip anything okay. that's 600 square feet I think we could easily slide it in we'll still be well underneath that's what uh, one okay. of our concerns I'm sure you would be but why not just treat it the way it's treated in the lease I'm sure that's no concerns for me right. okay. so okay. I guess the, the question is from our, our committee is this something you would like um, Paul to or Paul to look at this and create a provisions I would say to the ordinance to uh, enable the mall to modify to do these modifications well, to, to be fair to the discussion, I have to recuse myself. I actually have a number of clients in the mall, so I'm not going to participate in that part of the discussion, but I can participate in the part about amending the ordinance vis-a-vis -vis the parking. That I would support. Okay. What's that? What's well, there are two ordinances, I understand, that they're being... No, it's all, it's all zoning with respect to their requests. But there are two pieces of zoning. There are two pieces of zoning attributes that are one to be changed. One deals with the parking, other deals with the, um, the retail aspect. Well, I, mean, I, don't, I don't mind recusing myself from the entire thing. Well, but not necessarily. I'm just inquiring. It, are, <coughs> is, are your clients not affected by the parking change? My clients are affected by any ordinance change. Yes, I would agree. Um, I just have one other question. Are these uh, temp uh, these kiosk like structures? They're they're not these permanent kiosks. These permanent permanent vendor stations. Displays. Um, will they be other merchants other than those existing in the mall? So, for example, you have a Starbucks in the mall. I'm assuming Starbucks will stay. So this would not be, could be a coffee establishment, but it would be other than 
the, yes. would be a satellite of a, of a Starbucks, or it could be. It could be. So I, I wouldn't rule that out, um, particularly when it comes to the Italian marketplace concept. If they wanted to open a coffee stand out front of their old marketplace, you know, that makes sense. But I think we would certainly get interest from outside parties that are not in the mall, and I think that would enhance the food offering. And the Italian marketplace, is that a company or we're yes. just, it, does it have a name? Yeah, the, their presence in Puerto Rico is called Il Nuovo Mercado, but they're in the current process of rebranding themselves to enter the U.S. market. So I actually have a conversation with them on Thursday to try and lock down what their name and branding materials are going to look like. And is that their only uh, establishment is the one in Puerto Rico? Or no, they they're um, throughout Italy. Yeah, they're, they have a variety of operations in Florence. They're based in Florence. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rosen. Okay. Yeah. I'm for it. Thank you. So there you have it. So right. you, you are directed oh, to you. work on the language. I'll address something for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we, can we speak on this? No. You know that there'll be public session in a little bit. Okay, other new business, which is not on the uh, I am going to create um, a steering committee for on affordable housing in connection with our affordable housing builder from these issues. Uh, the purpose of the committee is to provide for the monitoring of the declaratory judgment litigation filed by the township in connection with the review and approval of the housing element and fair share housing plan by the court and standing master who is to be appointed by the court. The steering committee will also monitor all developments associated with the suit commenced against the township and the planning board by 85 Woodland, etc. et al. The steering committee shall meet periodically when needed to address issues arising in connection with both matters to hear reports from counsel and consultants and to discuss and formulate guidance for response to developments associated with each of those lawsuits. When required, the steering committee shall make recommendations to the full township committee on material policy alternatives so that the full township committee can consider these matters and authorize action. The steering committee shall also manage all public information items to apprise the public of significant developments in the cases. The steering committee shall consist of the following, the mayor, uh, Ms. Diane Thal Eglo, uh, the planning board chair or his designee, our attorney Paul Falcon, our planning board attorney Ed Buzak, Paul Phillips, and Alex McDonald. Okay, so at our next meeting, I will ask to have that uh, we approve that. Yeah. So we'll have a resolution with respect to that at our next meeting. Okay, old business. All right, my favorite old business. We, uh, I am looking to have the ordinance 7 35.4 be repealed, hidden parking in off street parking lots, meaning that we can back in parking for those of us who like to back in park. It was something we discussed, I guess, when Robert was mayor. Um, and he adamantly opposed it. Um, however, was it last year? Oh, just last year? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I was mad. You were mad. I was mad. Um, he still adamantly opposed it. Um, That's true. Yes, he thought for some reason that people would come flying out of uh, parking lots if they were parked in back in and fly out forward. I, on the other hand, believe that it is much safer mm -hmm. to come out of a parking spot seeing what you're looking at as opposed to backing into other people. So that's uh, what I thought. I'd like to hear other people's thoughts and whether or not this is something that uh, the township committee will consider and support. Well, I remember last year when a resident had brought this up in a very impassioned plea, and it was very sensible, and for some reason they got put aside because Robert thought it I think it does make sense. When the parking lot at the Melbourne train station, particularly that I'm more familiar with, people come zooming out and there's hordes of people. I think it's a very smart change. And I think she even said that it wasn't it wasn't good signage and then she got a ticket. So it was kind of confusing. So I think it's a very good move. Any other thoughts? 
I um, don't object to the ordinance, but it shouldn't, uh, the language, supporting language of it shouldn't mention backup camera because it's not federally mandated, nor do all cars have backup cameras, so we want the ordinance to be based upon the use of a backup camera. I agree with that. Any other thoughts? Okay, so we have a I'm okay with it, but I'm not sure we we need it. Uh, well, in terms of parking enforcement, it does we don't it doesn't matter either way because we're doing plates. So we used to not allow it because we wanted to make sure people had parking permits. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're using plates, we don't have to worry about it. I was concerned that it would affect uh, the violations bureau being able to tell who doesn't have permits, like business permits <coughs> or commuter permits. Uh, they seem to think that if we have a payback plate, that won't be an issue. But again, I don't know if we want people in the train station in the morning backing in when they're parking and running for a train, but I guess if they have the option and they're good at it. And some people will just head in, park if they have two like, uh, for tandem, it. Right, tandem sure. spots. I hadn't really given it much thought, so I'm not opposed to it. Mm -hmm. Think more about it. Is there more any thoughts? Mm -hmm. No, I. I Okay, one or the other? Yeah, I, I understand when you're um, when it's that double kind of parking that if you get there at 6 a.m. in the morning that you want to pull straight through for easy access on your on your exit. Um, but if, if I'm thinking of the Melbourne train station when you're parking along the the track walk, um, I think it can be confusing some in and some out. I think it's prep. Pre uh, right. And we're not just talking about driver's the choice. We're not just talking about the Melbourne train station either. Right. We're talking about all the parking lots within town. Some do have signs, but they're probably very signs. old. Some donor signs. Right. Right. Is, it, is there any reason to maybe pilot it for a little while and see how people do with it before we officially do it? Why is everybody afraid of back and park? <laughs> You don't get no, no one has to do it. Right, no one has it's to just do an it. Option, that's all. Exactly. It's just giving people an option instead of saying you can't do it. Okay. Or you get a ticket for doing it. If we're ticketing at that moment. All right. So I'm not, I, I think that we will go forward with that. The other piece of old business is I'm still looking for a member of our public to uh, be part of an ad hoc to look at space for moving the DPW. I have one member of the public who's already mm. requested to participate, but I am looking for one more person. So if you are interested or know somebody who might be interested, please let us know. You can let me know. You can let Christine Gaddy know. You can let maybe Patrick know or anyone else on the committee know. Thank you. All right. And now the time has come for public comment. Oh, wait, old business, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, the old business, yes. I would just like to have the status of the engineering company we hired to get the staff ready to look into removing the flexing parking. Where that is at? Uh, yes, he was uh, actually out shooting uh, grades mm -hmm. yesterday for the, for the project. And so um, he is uh, pushing a schedule that we had for him. But, um, you know, and, and, and certainly I'll have more of an update from him once he starts putting that together uh, that I'll certainly share with the committee. Right. Um, but, but, it, but it is Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All discussion? I invite you to speak. Please come to the lectern. State clearly your name and address for the record. Speak into the microphone so that your comments can be understood by all and properly recorded. Whenever an audience or committee member reads from a prepared statement, please give an email and copy to the Township's clerk office at cgotti at Melbourne, TWP .org. Um, you will be limited to three minutes um, in accordance with our general practice. Um, and you Please state your name and address. Thank you. David Cosgrove, 99 LQ Terrace in Short Hills. Um, so thank you for the update on the, on the litigation. I appreciate that. My question is, um, you, you, Mayor, you mentioned a um, setting up a steering committee uh, to, to deal with the lawsuit. Um, and I'd like to see if there could be a public member of that steering committee. I would volunteer. Thank you. Thank you. Any? No, yes, sir. That's enough. That's enough? That's enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
three factory drive shuttle. I just wanted to respond to the um, wall manager about the kiosks. Um, I've seen them in other um, malls, in Livingston Mall and uh, Willowbrook Mall, and I've seen them at airports in particular where people sit around and have, have drinks or have refreshments. And I just don't think it's really um, the kind of uh, vendor that we would really want to have in the mall. I think there's enough food places for people to be able to, uh, you know, have their fill and enjoy without having this in the center of the um, walkways. That's my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Corey Biller, Clarkson Raleigh Road, Milburn. Um, I noticed in the beginning there was a lot of sort of good and welfare. I am on the uh, July 4th committee. I thought it would be uh, worthwhile to mention we are having a fundraiser this Saturday at the Par 3 course uh, to help raise funds for the annual July 4th um, festivities at the high school. So, especially since we're on camera now, I figure. <laughs> to promote that, um, I had a question. I'm not sure if you guys can answer questions. Uh, you mentioned that the Ely will have a full bar. I was wondering, the liquor license that they have, is that owned by the mall or is that transferred somehow? It was owned by the mall. The other thing that you had mentioned, parking in the deck. Uh, I would encourage you guys to consider changing some of the commuter spots to daily spots. I noticed, um, I generally don't commute into the city, but when I do, I've noticed yep. that there are some spots open for the commuter spots and really not any daily spots open. So you have to find, you know, all the way back by the park or someplace and walk. So yep. if there's an opportunity to consider, and I've spoken to people and they've had similar experiences where there are commuter spots open but not daily spots. So if we can consider shifting some of those, that'd be helpful. So is this in the deck you said? Yeah, the deck and the, by the library in particular. The library had like two or three the day I was looking, but none of the deck was spots open. So I went to the deck, none of them were available. So ultimately parked sort of back into the South Mountain area. Just right. You could have walked me home. At that point, I probably should have, yes. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to mention was with regard to the flex parking and the bidding that, that we're doing. Um, I do encourage looking at removing the flex parking. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a worthwhile thing to look at. The one thing I want to caution is that we not necessarily rush to do it at the soonest opportunity and maybe look into speaking, in speaking with residents. And as you know, I am running the primary, so I've been talking to a lot of people. And some of the businesses seem to be concerned about rushing it through because they're just starting to recover from the construction from complete streets to rush it through now. So I think we should probably speak to the businesses and residents about best timing. And also, by delaying a little bit, we might be able to discuss some sort of mutual benefit, maybe, for example, talking with JCPNL about power line bearing and stuff, because if we're going to spend the money to rip up the streets we should probably think about some sort of alternative benefit that we're going to get from it aside from aside from just ripping up the street. So that's just some food for thought and I appreciate the time. So thank you. Thank you. Bill Kirsch, 93 Cedar Street. I uh, just to keep the head in parking controversy alive or question about it does the does the uh, the local uh, does the, the parking uh, the traffic uh, contingent of local police have an opinion about it? Do they feel one was safer than the other? Do they feel there would be any problem with seeing who has a parking permit or not? Have they about it? They, they've actually opined on it and, and, and preferred the appeal as well. I think they, uh, they feel like it's a little bit outdated at this point. Uh, generally, like technology that we use to enforce these laws as just you know, people's ability to to, to back in and, and also to just, it's a choice at this point um, uh, that is offered to people. But certainly from an enforcement standpoint, which would be their major concern, it's not. Mm -hmm. And one other thing, would it be possible to print on both sides of the paper for the paperwork? Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, it had been. It might have just been I messed up this meeting. I, I, it had been. Is it usually? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, I was looking at it. And I was thinking. I thought we had been doing that. Yeah. Okay. I didn't ask why. <laughs> we usually do. Christine isn't coming to meetings late anymore, so we'll make sure we press buttons. <laughs> Good point. Save the trees. Hi, Deborah Nevis, 65 Road. When you started talking about the Sachs building, I um, just wanted to follow up whether you guys have had an opportunity to speak to members of the Springfield Township regarding the old Sachs site and um, what might be happening in terms of trying to plan for the site? I spoke to the mayor of Springfield and told him to keep, I asked him to keep me in the loop. I believe they're probably going to be doing some housing there. Okay. And would that affect uh, entering from Melbourne Avenue or? I guess it would depend on who the developer is, what their project looks like. Um, but we are going to keep in the loop, and if we have any, if, if, if we have the ability, if we have a zoning mm -hmm. issue again, yeah, I would ask that we do a joint meeting or, or a joint application because what happened last time was simply absurd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Janet Pizor, one eight six Main Street. Curiosity question. I was not here the last meeting, the previous meeting, but one before that, we were talking about the survey results of the flexible parking, mm -hmm. and I vaguely remember the numbers where they fell, and I remember, um, Madam Mayor, you're saying statistically this is not significant. And we also know there was an aggressive campaign to solicit for the negative responses to the flexible parking. So my question is, how did the leap start? How did we go to authorizing collection of bids for the removal of flexible parking when the last thing that I knew was survey was insignificant? Well, I wasn't here that meeting. So that occurred while I wasn't here. And I presume that my fellow members felt that spending half a million dollars to rip out Flexible parking, if that's what it's going to cost, is money well spent. But you'll have to ask them to respond to that. Well, I can, I'll respond. Okay. The, uh, the two aren't necessarily dependent upon each other. I found the uh, method of survey uh, uh, to be improper and gave no attention to the survey res uh, results, but still supported the expenditure of the money to review uh, that issue. And so I don't think that, I think it's a little bit of a leap to say the survey results, while they may have been attacked by some and supported by others, uh, caused the decision making. I think a lot of us reached that decision independent of any of the survey results. Can anybody else give me some feedback as to their opinion? Um, I don't believe, I know I did not solicit for negative feedback. I did post that the survey was available. We posted it on the Milburn. Um, website and the Facebook and I did post it on my committee page and my Facebook page. I don't know who's going to look at my pages and see it, but they, other people, shared with two people who shared with two people and it shared on its own. It had its own momentum. And that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. Again, I just want to say that the survey with such minimal responses Really, we're, we're looking at the silent majority that probably don't care one way or the no, other. Absolutely. And in the silent majority, I think that they might feel Township Committee has lost mm -hmm. its mind by putting in this new structure, this new development, and then ripping it out two years later. Because it's, I still believe it's premature. And as with the head in parking, back in parking, it gives us an option. Thank you. Okay. You want to get down? Okay. I wasn't going to come up, but. <laughs> yeah. 
I absolutely disagree. Alyssa Sutton, 75 Mountain View Road, Milburn. Please, please take the time to walk around and actually talk to the merchants in town. I was just walking up and down again because of our farmer's market. So I got to chat with people in the upper part of Milburn Ave, the lower part. People don't like the flex parking. They don't. It's dangerous. I saw a car door come off because somebody opened it. It's, you don't have to remove it in August, but it is ridiculous and it must come out. My main question is, the upper part of Milburn Avenue, for some reason, is not considered part of the downtown of Milburn. It's the first time I found out about this. because not part of DMDA? Right. Yes. Okay. It's, it's not encumbered. As, I, as far as I know, Short Hills is a part of Milburn. Is Short Hills in Milburn? Am I saying that correctly? Short yes. Hills is a section of Milburn. Okay. okay. So if Short Hills is a section of Milburn, why is the upper part of Milburn Avenue, which is still Milburn Avenue, and this part of Milburn Avenue, which is still Milburn Avenue, one thing? Because it's so utterly confusing. It, it feels like on so many levels, everything, the right hand isn't talking to the left hand. There's so many things. To me, this seems silly that this wouldn't be joined. Okay, but the DMDA was a district created in 92, and whoever created the district at that time did not include, did a footprint of the district, which is, does not include Upper Milburn Avenue. Okay. I'm asking the new township committee, I know Jody's our liaison, this has to be dealt with because this is just symptomatic of all the things that are just not handled and not just being administered properly. I personally would like to see the footprint increased because there's more participation. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's it'll be more money. money. Yeah. Of course, there's, there's, there's more. Sorry. But but they listen, might, might I, I consider squirrel on the bee just as important as flywheel. There, it's all we're all one. I, I don't know that one thing has to do with being important is part of the question. The question is the DMDA is, is supposed to have a certain obligations and services to the district it's serving. It's it, it's serving. So we, should we have a second DMDA then? Well, because no, Maplewood has to. We we could have sixteen. We need different parts of them also, but that's a question as to whether or not those parts of town want to be either part of the district, whether the DMDA wants to bring them into it. So that's a question I'm, I probably that needs to be addressed to the to the merchants there as well as the current DMDA. And that's something that certainly we can look at. Yeah. I'm definitely for looking at it. I, I, think, I think the think current president is in looking at it. Again, I think they have to be able to manage their own district first before they start expanding it, but definitely open to it. So. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Hi. Tara Kirkus, 206 Milburn Avenue, I'm doing my third history. Um, I have some questions about the flood mitigation pre uh, presentation that we saw tonight. I didn't ask I just, I didn't get up and ask. I just wanted a just kind of understanding of what the purpose of that was. So it's not specific, just, is anything happening? Yeah, so the purpose of that was as a reintroduction because um, those projects began back in 2014. Um, again, two of the projects that were initially started on in their flood mitigation program uh, have been completed. The Gilbert Place Pump Station, which is the major project in that in that group, um, has stalled and um, is starting to gain traction again. So I wanted to reintroduce the committee and the public to those projects that they're working on. Okay, and just what's the process then that happens? He gave the presentation tonight, and then what happens? Well, right now we're currently, as he stated in the presentation, we're working on easements that need to be obtained before we can get permitted to DEP and move forward with the project. Okay, thank you. And the bike sign on Milburn Avenue, is that coming down? Or can we put in a bike lane? I believe it's coming down as part of the bunch list, if not. But it's not down this <coughs> week. Um, it should be because they're up. Okay, so I guess my question is also that when we take out the flexible parking, when that does happen, is it is it something that we can look at as a whole of bringing a bike lane back into town or bringing a bike lane into town? Is that <coughs> is that who I need to go to? Well, I I I think that again that that would be um, a discussion. 
discussion that would, would, would have to be approved by them as well. Okay. And then uh, the last thing is just the left hand turn from Maine onto um, Essex. Yes, I, is that still being I, considered and looked at? Still looked at. All right, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Terry Heller, 343 Mulberry. May I address to either Paul or to the mall a question or direct it to you to direct to them? You can direct it to us. Right. There's 100,000 square feet, 30,000 to be office, which is probably fine, not my issue, but I think an issue of concern to rateable and to renting the space to being, I think, Class A office space would probably be the anticipation. I know if you were to rent an office, I know if Mr. Falcon were to rent an office, uh, if your firm were to rent an office, you're not going to want to share parking with other people shopping at the mall. I would presume, um, you know, part of Paul's analysis or part of the mall's offering is they're going to set aside a portion of the parking deck or, I mean, yes, interior, that someone's not going to want an outside parking space. So just as part of the review, just please consider where those spaces are going to come from. And if it's four per thousand, five per thousand, it's something between 120 and 150 parking spaces. Um, just to follow up, um, not new to me, not new to this DC, and introduced by Hatch Fund, I'd like to reintroduce the possibility, particularly now that Footer is empty. It's a tremendous opportunity, both from a flood standpoint, from a visual standpoint, uh, Alex and DPW cleared the river after the last major heavy rain um, to the north of the river. If you look into Taylor Park now, it looks awful. You know, all the things that flow down below are not things that are affecting flooding in the downtown. The park looked beautiful you know, with the cherry trees when they finally did bloom a little bit late. Um, there's no reason, and this is prior to Alex, after every hurricane, after every storm, we're going to clear the floodway. We never do it in anticipation, and that is an issue with the reservoir, that's a whole separate thing different than, you know, tonight's discussion, but how that reservoir and who's going to make that decision to manually let that water go. But in the interim, we have some aesthetic issues, and I don't know why, at least south of the river, we couldn't keep that clean, as well as north of the river, to consider taking down footers. I think Hatchmont will tell you that it is an impediment to the flashlight. It's not part of the larger flood issue, but it is part of the flooding that does occur and Basilico, and Goldberg's, and, uh, and other restaurants, and, and water that comes down Main Street would not occur as a result of the footer building not being there. And aesthetically, personally, hey, it's a loss for rateable, but we may increase rateables by creating a greater visual, and just something to ask them to consider. If it is something beneficial, why wouldn't we ask them to do it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I comment with anything? I did speak to Alex about um, the river in between the Milburn Deli and that little decorating store. That there is some debris and trees in DPW. Have they gotten back to you if they're allowed to go in there to move some of those larger logs? Mm -hmm. Anything that they can get from the bridge, mm -hmm. they will. But, um, but generally, um, you know, they are going to have to seek permission to get in there with any equipment to do that. If they can get in there and, and, and do it on foot, so to speak, but mm -hmm. that's, you know, they, they have not gotten back to you at this point. Mm -hmm. as well but they've been in other parts of the river. They've been in the river off Milburn Avenue with the cherry picker, picking out large logs and logs. So right now, mm -hmm. no, I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying, in particular, the space that she's talking about. And that but she you can get into it from Teller Park the same way you're getting into it from Milburn Avenue. From not the same. Not necessarily in between those in, in between the buildings there. She's, she's she's describing the area right over the bridge between the deli and between signature spaces. Unless you're able to access that from the what now is Regal Bank, I guess, that parking lot um, with with some sort of machinery. It's a, it's a more difficult area. It's like little to islands to teams that right. be formed there, so things are getting stuck on that right. little island. Yeah. But after I read, and I agree with you, Army Corps of Engineers controls and rules, but to get into there uh, for aesthetics is, mm -hmm. is not something, but if it's something that helps clear right. the pathway, yes, you can't just arbitrarily do anything that's going to call and tell on you, but if you want to follow the procedure, Yes, it, it would be a nice thing, you know, to do. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Nancy Stone, 
resident and business owner of two businesses in town. So, Address, please. Excuse me? Address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 266 Essex Street okay. and 275 North. All right, so I was voted as treasurer, or, um, and uh, we've been having issues about uh, getting passwords into the accounts for the DMDA. It has been a challenging experience, um, and no bank reconciliations have been done since January, February, March. I have the April bank statement. So from the monies that were appropriated and given, there is only $35,455 left. We are, I am trying to get this uh, bank reconciliation done because it seemed that most of the monies that were given were to pay old bills that were uh, taken on by the previous board, which was very disenchanting uh, to find out um, after I personally asked for the locks to be changed and uh, the old president was able to gain access with Jillian to get in and write these unauthorized checks. So the checks cleared and it was very disturbing and I want that to be brought to light because that is not what this current board would like to, uh, what I would like to see this current board do. There are a lot of activities going on that I am not pleased with. Um, which is authorizing expenses. Rent has not been paid because the bank accounts, we needed minutes and we needed to go to the bank with these minutes and get the transfer of the signatures over. I suggested getting the, um, the old president, since he's still assigning on the account, to at least pay the bills that need to be paid so that lights don't get shut off and the rent gets paid and everybody's at least the maintenance things from this balance of this money. We, this evening, uh, Jackie was great. Uh, they had a farmer's markers meeting and Melissa was terrific and they agreed on uh, moving forward with the sidewalk sales. There was approximately $8,000 spent last year on that. Uh, we're looking to spend substantially less because I'm looking at every single line item as it comes up and uh, there we approved, and Alex, you were terrific about approving the free parking for the Friday and Saturday uh, for this uh, sidewalk sale to occur because a lot of the merchants really wanted those sidewalk sales and wanted the activity in the downtown. I personally don't participate in them. It's a security issue for me, but a lot of the merchants do love that and have that uh, activity in the town, so we're excited about that. I also wanted to let Carrie Heller know that the, um, the audits were done for 2015 and 16. The, it was paid for out of the uh, uh, monies that were appropriated and given, mm -hmm. and we're looking to do the 2017 uh, immediately. So we're going to work on that in the next month. So I just want to give you that update as well. Yeah, Thanks luck. so much. We need it. <laughs> Anyone else? Make a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. 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 Second